Well, it was a toss-up to know <laughs> what title to give to this message today. But anyway, according to the bulletin, it's the Fellowship of Believers. Well, after the arrival of the Holy Spirit, there were discernible characteristics which were a direct result of not only the relationship with Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Lord, but those characteristics of the early church were engineered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit made them who they were. So let's look at those things today, keeping in mind that a new wave of the Holy Spirit is going to descend upon the church in the latter days. How many of you believe, believe in that? Just like the re revivals of the past. Like the 70s. Do you remember the 70s? Wow, that was fun. So what defines a vital church? Well, the first thing, and you can kind of follow along there if you want. There's no PowerPoint today. The first thing is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Well, in those days, they only had the writings of the Old Testament. Didn't have the New Testament yet. But because of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the first apostles were gifted as teachers. Now, they didn't invent the truth or the message of the gospel. They were taught under the power of the Holy Spirit as he led them into a knowledge of all truth. They were like these empty vessels that just, just you know, and they came from all walks of life. And the Holy Spirit just went zap, 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 and we're going to preach, you know, those 12 guys. So they, they simply took what the Holy Spirit taught them and they passed it on. That's what they did. So the apostles taught new believers the lessons that they had learned from Jesus. They also interpreted the Old Testament prophecy in the light of the arrival of the Messiah. The light had come on in the apostles, some of whom had little or no education, preached and shared and taught with great enthusiasm. They say that the best BA you can have isn't a Bachelor of Arts from the university. But to be born again of the Spirit of God, and that is the truth. If a pastor has a certificate hanging on the wall that indicates that he or she has gone to full secondary education, it doesn't mean squat unless that pastor is born of the Spirit of God and baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. Amen. Amen. So the early church listened and learned and grew strong in the Lord and truth and knowledge, and their lifestyles changed because good teaching affects. Change. You know why? Because it goes right to the heart. This doesn't mull around up here in the head. It goes right to the heart and it changes us. Amen? Amen? So it doesn't just teach facts. It doesn't just share information so that Christians soak it up and be cut up to become big fat sponges. That's not what God intends. The real desired result of biblical teaching is growth and change. It's supposed to result in maturity. And that's what happened in the lives of the members of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings so that their lives changed and they matured in Christ. Secondly, what other vital thing was going on? Well, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. A fellowship doesn't mean just that they sat around and drank tea together and exchanged pleasantries and conversation. Christian fellowship, by definition, by definition means partnership. And sharing. That's the biblical meaning of fellowship. Now that shines a whole different light on our English word fellowship, doesn't it? We can have tea together now with others anytime we want. Now that the isolation period is ending, and that's nice. I think that we can meet in bubble groups of 10 or something like that outside of our churches where we've been given permission permission to meet with 30% of our capacity, but we can have tea together now, and that's really nice. Now, where was I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but biblical fellowship, see, it's please. I look here and I see one thing, and I look through the Bible, and I see another thing, but anyway. But biblical fellowship among Christians is more than having tea together. It means sharing and being part, partners in advancing the kingdom of God. But what does that require? It requires commitment and intentionality to discover how to reach a community for Christ. And it takes risk. Risk of something not working. 
Often a church hesitates to do something because they'll say, but what if it doesn't work? Well, so what if it doesn't work? Try something else. Doesn't mean we've failed if we've tried something and it didn't work. We just try something else because you know what failure is? It's not trying. Amen? Failure is when we don't try. So real Christian fellowship is a partnership that takes stick to and a willingness to put all our shoulders to the wheel. It's, and what's more is that real Christian fellowship, if the church is to grow, is not an option. Having a partnership in the gospel as a Christian is not optional. You find your place, you discover your gifts, and you show up to do it, and you're really good at that. I love the way this church takes responsibility. It's very good. We do it willingly, and we do it with a gladness to see your heart. So what else describes the vital church? Well, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now, this is a direct reference to, the, to Holy Communion, or the Lord's Supper. It isn't a reference to having a meal at somebody's house. It is important for believers to observe <coughs> this meal regularly as a remembrance meal, and to do it together as a body, remembering Christ's body broken and his blood shed for us. Now I hope that many of you were able to share the Lord's Supper on two of the YouTube videos while we were closed. For my part, it was very strange. I sat down there at the head of that table, pulled it up, put a chair there, there, and I looked out. <laughs> I could only see chairs, but I had to imagine you with me because I knew that on YouTube you would be. So I hope you were able to tune into that. That's the best we could do. But still, as we did it, we shared in the unity of the Holy Spirit, didn't we? Even though we were apart physically. So here's a question. Why is that one of the defining characteristics of the early vital church? It's because the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central doctrine, doctrine of the Christian faith. Jesus gave that meal as a symbolic act to be used to help us preserve correct doctrine until he comes. And to retain and remember his sacrifice for the redemption of humanity. As long as we keep doing it, we're not going to lose that doctrine about the death of the crucifixion, the death, and the, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll keep it until the end. Now going on, we discover what Acts defines the vital church. They devoted themselves to prayer. Well, I remember hearing stories of evangelical churches of the past which would gather together on Saturday night to pray in order to prepare themselves for Sunday morning so they could go back and pray some more. We seem to be too busy. Maybe there's a hockey game on. Saturday night, well, if we ever get back to it early. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm saying? They devoted themselves to prayer. They set, set aside special times to do that. Now, prayer isn't just something that we tack on at the end of a meeting or something that we always do alone at home. In the end times, it will become vital that we gather together in groups to cry out to God. We're in the end times, folks. We better get used to crying out to God together. We're in the end times, and things are changing very fast. And Sam reminded me of that this morning. I agree with her. Things are changing pretty fast, aren't they? So I'll just quote 2 Chronicles 7, 14 and 15. And if you know it, say along with me. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Well, listen to the rest of it. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. In this place. I kind of have a feeling that was a reference to the, to the temple, right? In this place. Okay, so anytime the Spirit moves you, you want to gather some Christians together, come up in here and cry to God, God will make sure that door gets open for you. Okay. There are many references to prayer in the Bible. Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, and I believe this model of prayer is not meant to be only used. 
used for private prayer, but for corporate prayer, Jesus said, pray like this, Our Father, which are in heaven, notice the use of the word our, and that signifies to me that a group of people meeting together, prayer is what he intended right there. Our Father, which are in heaven. So let's move on. What else describes that by the church? High like this and signs, wonders, and miracles. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Myself, along with many others, desire to see that kind of move of the Holy Spirit in the church once again. Supernatural ministry, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Some would say there are miracles going on. Yes, there are. I do agree. There are. Yet you have to admit that in ages past, when there were great revivals, tremendous miracles happened as people were saved and healed and delivered visibly within the congregation, the fellowship of believers. I believe it's about to happen again as people come before the Lord searching for hope and searching for peace and a longing to be saved and a longing to be healed. I believe that as people humble themselves and turn to the Lord for healing and they unlock the power of their faith, we will see miraculous healings and signs and wonders near to the return of Christ. I believe it. As people unlock the power of their faith to receive. I believe that, that they have not been commonplace, signs, wonders, and miracles, because if they were, then pe people would have come searching for the experience of the supernatural rather than searching for Christ and the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. So maybe God has said no. This sign, this is the only sign I'm going to give you right now, and that's the sign of Jonah. So be happy with it. <laughs> but in the end times, folks, I believe it's going to change. The sign of the Spirit. Another defining feature of the vital church is that they were willing to sometimes sell things or sell private property or property, sorry, of their own if someone in the church was in need so that they could provide for them. Now let's get this straight. The early church was not a cult. They didn't sell all their property and move in together and live in communes like other religious groups did at that time. Like the Jewish sect of the Essenes who lived in the desert, the Essenes were, were a true commune of 4,000 people living isolated from the world in the desert and the Dead Sea Scrolls testified to that. But the early Christians had everything in common in a different way, and let me explain. They knew that they really didn't own what they possessed personally. God owned it all. So selling things in order to provide for others was just shifting around God's stuff. That's, that was their attitude. The law of scripture is this, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, Luke 6, 38. Let's move on to the seventh thing that defines the vital church. They met together in the temple courts every day. They went to the place of prayer to worship God to pray, and they did it every day. The Jews had established prayer times during the day, every day, and obviously this had spilled over into the practice of the early church. Can you imagine the Christians going to and from the temple courts, passing one another along the way, going and coming from the place of prayer? Oh, hi, you going to pray? Oh, I was just there. See you tomorrow. Okay, so they passed one another, coming and going every day to the place of prayer. It would be so nice if the church could be left on lock for people to come in and sit and pray during the week or to invite a, a few fellow Christians to meet in the church for prayer spontaneously. Now, I know we can't do that. For security reasons, we have to keep the church locked for practical reasons. But it seems a shame, doesn't it, to have to lock our churches during the week during these difficult times when people in the community just might like to come in and sit and experience the presence of God like we do. I remember as a child riding my bike to my local one-room church during the week in the little fishing village on number three highway. 
And that's where I went to Sunday school on Sunday mornings and sang in the choir, too. We had these little beanies and these little gowns and everything. But the church was not locked during the week. So I would go in and pray and gaze at this great big picture of Jesus that hung on the wall behind the pulpit. And it was a very spiritual and wonderful experience, you know. And sometimes other kids would come in, too. So there'd be all these little bicycles parked outside our little one-room church. But that was our church. And we were welcome to go in there whenever we wanted to. And the adults, the, the elders, they didn't worry about it. We never had any elders show up to see what we were doing. That was our church. And I'll never forget it, how free it was in those days. But let's just think about that kind of thing. How we might be able to open up the church of the community. I don't know. So what else made the early church vital? Well, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Well, those people really loved each other and they enjoyed getting together, obviously. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts and praised God. Praising God was part of their ordinary conversation. I heard lots of Christians talk that way these days, too. Wonderful to hear somebody say, well, praise God. You know what God did for me the other day. You know what happened? And praise God. Well, in spite of their God-praising talk, which must have been public, outsiders still respected them and showed them favor. They practiced hospitality. And I hadn't thought about that. You know what? That is a way of incorporating new believers into the church. People feel valued and loved if they are invited to come over for coffee or a simple meal when you're inviting other Christians over. And they sense your sincerity and your love for them. I know of the habit of some Christians having an extra chair, an empty chair, because a neighbor might show up. Okay? I remember older mentors who loved having Paul and I over for supper. And then they would lead us in prayer following the meal and all. Oh, that was such a mysterious and wonderful time to hear those old Christians pray. They'd lay hands on us. They'd have the hot seat and they'd put us in it. And then they'd lay hands on us and they'd pray. It was wonderful. There was a little group called Fourth Line Friendly Folks down there in Harwich Township. And we were just baby Christians in the Cedar Springs United Church. And we didn't want to meet, miss the meetings of the Fourth Line Friendly Folks. They were all older than we were. Their kids were growing up gone. So we would go. And they just loved to invite them, them the younger people, the younger couples, the younger people, into their fourth line friendly folk Bible studies. And they went from house to house to do it. It didn't take place in the church at all. They had home Bible studies and we all go around, you know, we'd all cram into their little, little living room and then the hostess would serve cookies and, and tea and coffee afterward. But it was so easy to become incorporated into the body of Christ through that channel, through that avenue. See what I'm talking about? So the calling of God upon new believers and young people's people begins with how we treat them, how we include them, how we nurture them, how we invest our time in them, how we invite them. So we need to do it anytime we can. In conclusion, as a result of all these vital characteristics of the early church, the Lord added to the numbers daily those who were being saved. So I want to ask this, how can we do things a little differently? How can we do the same vital things in the church today? We don't need to do more. We're already doing enough because we're a small church. So I'm not suggesting that we do more. I'm suggesting we figure out how to do things differently that we already do. So think about it. They devoted themselves to the Bible's teachings. How do we do that differently? I don't know. Maybe you come up with something. They devoted themselves to the fellowship and participating in and sharing the work 
but of the spread of the gospel. Thinking outside the box. Thinking outside the box, how do we spread the gospel? You know, we can be very creative and uh, do it differently. How do we regularly observe the Lord's Supper and do it differently? Well, there's a good question. Do we always have to do it in here? <clears throat> Let's get thinking. Think outside the box. They devoted themselves to prayer. Do we always have to do it in here? Think about that. Sharing with other Christians in need. As time goes on, you know, the opportunities will arise. Our economy isn't in very, very good shape right now, is it? But where is it going to go? Practicing hospitality and praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So where do we need to experiment and change or possibly grow? Giving it sincere effort, the Lord will add to our numbers daily those who are being saved. The final hope for today comes from what Elaine read in 1 Peter chapter 4. May we love one another deeply from the heart because love covers a multitude of sins. You know, you know what that means? Love doesn't forgive sins. Jesus forgives sins, right? Because he loves people. But it means that love is patient with others when we sin. So we don't become judges of one another. We just pray for one another and we're patient with one another. We protect the other person while, while that person is working through that thing in their lives, you know, and it covers them. Love covers a multitude of sins as Jesus does his work. Amen. We can do all of the same things to be a vital church as the early church did, but without love, it will all fail. So let us continue to underscore our ministry with love in this vital church. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are 